Our three experts are Bernard Ivcic from uh, Zelena Aktia, Friends of the Earth Croatia. Uh, he is the leader of the Sustainable Transport Program and a uh, long-time activist and leader of the campaign for Croatia without coal. Um, Christophe Boval from uh, Belgium is a, mobi a mobility expert from the Department of uh, Mobility at the province of West Flanders in uh, Belgium. Before uh, his uh, public ser uh, servant career, he was a journalist uh, who covered issues on uh, such as transport and uh, railways for a Belgian newspaper. And our third expert is um, Malen freudendahl Pedersen. She is a professor in ur uh, urban planning at the University of Aalborg in Denmark. And she is an author of several books on the topics uh, on mobility. Uh, so our, our first uh, speaker will be Bernard. So uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello to everyone. Um, so yeah, like as one of the tasks is to present the rallies in our countries in a way that could be beneficial for others. So maybe to uh, like some good examples. It is quite hard task to present Croatian railways in such a way, but uh, I, I will try. Um, uh, which is a pity because uh, yeah, railways in Croatia, um, I mean, they were introduced back in uh, 1860s, uh, so like 160 years. And for like, I would say for a century, they were really a backbone of the economy of several different countries that were like on this, this area. But yeah, for the last several decades, uh, the infrastructure is really getting worse and worse. Maybe like last few years, that, uh, that trend is changing slowly, very slowly. But yeah, I'll show some, some figures and uh, graphs, et cetera. Uh, just a moment for the presentation. Hmm. I don't see the presentation now, sorry. <clears throat> Do you see the, the... Oh yeah, yeah, here it is. Yeah, no, no, I couldn't find them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, basically like currently uh, Croatia, um, like when we are watching the Trans-European uh, Transport uh, Corridors, uh, basically Croatia has, uh, uh, when we are talking about railways, uh, only one, there's this Mediterranean uh, corridor, uh, this green line coming to uh, Spain, France, Italy, Slovenia, Croatia, and then Hungary. Uh, on this old uh, classification, we had uh, more corridors. Uh, so yeah, it was like the tenth corridor going mm -hmm. east to west. So it was red line. It was five C going from Budapest, Hungary, to Zagreb, which is capital of uh, of uh, Croatia, to Rijeka. And there was five C also going from uh, uh, Budapest, then to this eastern part. So this is then Bosnia Herzegovina, and then again this southern part. And as you can see, the actually really this southern part of Croatia is mostly without railways, except this small bit that is connected to uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. Uh, what you like the international lines? Uh, so yeah, there are like couple of countries, neighbor, neighbor countries that uh, Croatia still has um, uh, connection with, uh, uh, with the rail. Uh, unfortunately, for example, with Italy, even though it is rather near, we do not have direct uh, railway uh, connection. We have only Slovenia and then you have to wait in Ljubljana for a couple of hours for additional uh, um, additional train to go to, uh, to Italy. Um, but, uh, and yeah, I mean, the, the, the situation just like, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago was much better. There, there were much more international uh, railway lines. And now um, for most of these connections, <laughs> there's only one train per day. 
Uh, this is uh, this is the uh, the intensity uh, the, the the traffic intensity. So basically, uh, so this is city of Zagreb, and it is the area where um, the passenger trains are being used the most. But on all the other uh, lines, I mean, the situation is is much worse. Uh, like the average length of the journey in passenger train in Croatia is 39 kilometers, which is showing that basically it is being used mostly for very local travel and not for <laughs> like really inter intercity uh, uh, connections. Uh, the four largest cities in Croatia, so Zagreb is the largest, then here is the one of those four, second of those four and third of those four. All those connections, for all those connections, even though they're not like so far away, like they're from maybe from 300 to like, okay, 250 kilometers to 400 kilometers distance. Most, in most cases you need four to six or even more hours to travel with, uh, with the train. Uh, so, um, like I said at the beginning, the, um, well, the, the infrastructure was not um, maintained properly for several decades, which brought us to the situation that due, due to security reasons, the speed limit is like really low. So for 40% of railways, railway lines in Croatia, the speed limit is only 60 kilometers per hour. And only 7% of lines are in condition that is good enough to allow the speed limit to be higher than 120 kilometers per hour, meaning they could compete with the motorways on the speed. So yeah, I mean, that, because of for that reason, not most of the people are not using a uh, railway for a long. Uh, so yeah, to have a little bit of positive, uh, like some some hope, uh, is the renovation of lines. So these are the last available data for twenty one. So yeah, like around um, I don't know eighty kilometers uh, were uh, renovated. Well, Croatia has total uh, number of two thousand and like five or six hundred kilometers railways, which I mean in numbers it's not bad, like comparing with the size of the country, which is uh, fifty six thousand square kilometers. So yeah, I mean, we do have a network of rail that is quite developed uh, in sense of the lines, but the problem is that it is not maintained well. Uh, yeah, yeah, so this is uh, the transport of, um, of uh, passenger uh, and uh, goods uh, comparing the rail and road transport and like no matter what unit you use, is it like a ton uh, or uh, uh, net ton kilometers in all situations and in both years, 2020 and 2021, um, yeah, that like railways are really going um, far below road transport. And yeah, one of the one of the reasons, and not so of the reasons, is the lack of investing. So this is the graph. I mean, it's, it's in Croatia. It's one research that a couple of organizations produced a few years ago. But basically, this upper line, this red line, is showing uh, the investments per year, uh, like twenty years ago. Um, investments in road transport, and the yellow line is showing investments in the railways. So the difference is really substantial and it has like caused the current situation. In 1999, the strategy of transport development uh, estimated like rather 
I would say fair and good goals for the for the investments in uh, different modes of transport. But in the end, uh, it was like, in reality, it was completely different. And actually most of the funds went into the construction of new motorways. So now Croatia has like a good motorways and the railways. Uh, yeah, so the situation is kind of uh, shifting now, but yeah, it's, it's it's causing really a big frustration that the reason for this now slow change in everything is not that uh, you know decision makers uh, understood how railways are important not just for the econo economy but also for the green transition uh, it's just because you know the entire eu is recognizing it for ages ago so it has come to us uh, as well so they are plans and I think currently around 20 projects small or large scale for reconstruction of uh, infra infrastructure uh, yeah and about the reasons why the situation is as described I can talk more later during the discussion and I would end here I think I spent like 10 minutes. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, that was a very interesting uh, presentation, although a little bit depressing. Uh, we will move on to Christoph now, so uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I tried to share the screen. Do I succeed? Okay. So welcome on a virtual trip, uh, virtual train trip to Belgium. Of course, I will try to uh, respect the strict schedule, but you must know that uh, train trips in Belgium and punctuality do not match very well. So uh, the main complaint about uh, the railways is uh, is the, the lack of punctuality. So uh, I, I try to do my best, um, but don't blame on me if I uh, don't succeed. It's because of a too strong identification with the subject. Um, what uh, let's let's start with some uh, with some history. Um, Belgium was actually the first country on the European continent to have a train in 1835 already between Brussels, Brussels and, and Mechelen, and uh, Belgium was only five years uh, independent at that time. So it was really a, a statement by the by the by the new uh, the, by the young country uh, of its uh, independence and its ambitions um in in kind of uh, of or, or, uh, in view of uh, an economic development uh and they they succeeded uh, 35 years later there were already uh, 3000 kilometers of uh, tracks in the, in the country and um it was um, railways were uh, the symbol and and, and the catalyst uh, at the same time for the economy, uh, the economic development, especially in the uh, in the southern part of the of the country, um, Belgian bankers and investors uh, contributed to the expansion of the railways all over the world. And maybe the most famous of him, of them, was Georges Nagel Marcus, the, who founded the the famous Com Compagnie Internationale des Wagons Lits, which was a synonym of comfort, luxury, and speed. Um, and the, the 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 first setback came in fact in 1914 with the, with the german invasion and the first world war where uh, of course infrastructure was uh, was destructed and there was also a lack of, of rolling stock and that was in fact uh, on, a, on a smaller scale but nevertheless repeated uh, 25 years later with the with the second world war um a very important uh, moment uh, was in 1952, the opening of the North-South Junction in Brussels. Um, uh, you see here, uh, so it links in fact, the Brussels South with Brussels North. So uh, trains from that moment on could uh, go through. Um, uh, it was uh, an open wound literally in the urban tissue of, of Brussels, which you see on the on the picture um, on, on the, on the left hand side, and um, a whole neighborhood had to disappear for that. So uh, that's the little monument 
you see uh, above, uh, which is in, in fact at the front of the building of uh, Brussels uh, Central Station. Um, but in 52, at that moment, uh, the road traffic, cars and lorries, became pre predominant. And um, uh, railways look as an, an old fashioned way of, of, uh, of, of transporting. Uh, a good example uh, is, is here in, in Ghent, where you see uh, this is a, on the left uh, a picture of the, the, the years, uh, in, six, end, end of the year 60 when uh, the so-called flyover is built, in fact, on an ancient uh, bed of uh, a railway line to the center. So they built at that moment a, uh, a flyover uh, because that was, the, um, that was the future at that time, uh, bringing cars uh, as easily as possible uh, to nearly everywhere. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see an impression by urban planners today who dream of uh, of a more uh, green uh, flyover and no longer a car? So that uh, that shows um, uh, well the the change of of, of opinions in uh, uh, in that uh, in that period. So uh, at the end of of the eighties, beginning of the nineties, uh, a new era began um, due uh, to at one hand success of the TGV in France, uh, which proved that the train was not an old fashioned uh, mode of transport. And secondly, may, maybe more important still, is uh, the traffic jams that we got on, uh, on our, uh, on our uh, highways. Um, so what um, since, since the 80, uh, end the 80s, beginning 90s, you see this graph gives the, the growth of, uh, of travelers on uh, the network. So you see in two years, there was nearly a doubling. Um, how was it achieved? It was achieved by, uh, on the one hand, uh, offering more trains, uh, um, uh, offering more trains, and, um, but also uh, at least uh, as important um, tariff measures. So uh, reductions on weekends, um, uh, large contributions and uh, for uh, for commuters who who take the train. So there was really a, an effort to um, to increase uh, the use of the of the train. Um, yeah, this is the actual network of uh, of our uh, train net. Um, you see, it's still rather dense uh, although uh, lines has been closed in the in the, in the years uh, 60 and 70 but still a rather uh, close network and um, what you see is uh, is that brussels is is also literally at the center of the country uh, brussels is here um, which means that uh, the the ax the lines uh, many lines uh, and and also at least the, the main lines converge to uh, to Brussels. So Brussels is really uh, the heart of the of the network, uh, with this north south junction as, as really a, a crucial a crucial point in it. Um, uh, maybe return to the to the map. Uh, all the red lines are electrified lines, and all, and the green ones are not electrified. So uh, they are run by by diesel trains. So you see 90% of the lines are electrified, which is quite, uh, <clears throat> quite a high proportion, uh, which is of course uh, beneficial um, for, um, uh, for greening um, the transport uh, because uh, it's, it's already electrified uh, on condition of course that the electricity is, uh, is produced in a green way, but uh, at least the possibility is there. The, the diesel lines are, uh, are rather marginal. Um, another characteristic is that uh, on these lines, there are uh, no less than uh, 550 stops or stations uh, on, the, uh, on the network, which is, which is quite high. Um, but 80% of the travelers use only 80 uh, stations, uh, which means, of course, uh, a substantial financial effort to, uh, to keep open these all these uh, smaller stations you see here a comparison with uh, holland and switzerland two countries which are uh, in, in terms of size uh, rather similar 
Um, and you see there that uh, the density of the network eh, is, is very high, is uh, uh, nearly as high as uh, Switzerland, which, which is really uh, top of the world in, in, in terms of uh, railway connections. But in train kilometers offered and, um, and passenger kilometers realized, you see that uh, we are lagging behind, uh, uh, shortly behind uh, Switzerland, but also behind, uh, behind Holland. Uh, in, in Holland, there are less lines, but the lines that exist are, um, are more used are, uh, um, so, and, and are between real, the great, really the, uh, the great uh, or the large agglomerations. Um, uh, a view at the future. This is uh, the Rail Vision 2040, as you see, a very ambitious plan by the government. On the left hand, um, the freight traffic, uh, which should uh, double in size uh, in 2030 and in 2040, there should be a, a model part for the railways of 20%. Uh, today, it's not 10% on, uh, on, on freight traffic. And for travelers traffic, um, they want to, uh, to double uh, the modal part from 8% to 15%. Um, will, uh, will they succeed? Um, it's, uh, it's not sure, uh, because um, in, uh, keeping up uh, the, the, the network is, uh, is, is, is very hard. Uh, it takes uh, a lot of time um, to, to, uh, to renovate uh, a station, to renovate lines. Uh, so uh, also in terms of, of manpower, uh, it's, it's, it's a huge question. Uh, will they find not only the budget, but also the manpower to, um, to realize uh, this, um, um, these ambitions? It's, uh, it's questionable. But I would like to end by some more general considerations on, on, the, on the topic of, uh, of changing uh, uh, traffic modes. Um, you see here, uh, this graphic shows the, the growth in, 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 in traffic between 95 and 2012. Um, the train 60%, um, but the roads still 20%. So it means that even if railways um, uh, increase their model part, that doesn't mean necessarily that uh, road traffic is is uh, is um, is decreasing. Yeah, you, you see, although the the, the, ri the, the rise of the um, of the model part of the of the of the trains, road traffic was still growing. Um, and why is that? Um, that's be because of what we call induced demand. Yeah? Um, when this this is for a new Highway, but in fact, it it applies too when uh, when you get uh, you get a better train line. So people are going from the road to the train, but because there is uh, space on the road, uh, you get a new demand. You get people who, who who take the car, who take the road, who didn't who didn't do that before. Yeah? So uh, and at the end, uh, you create new developments along this road. And at the end, you have uh, you have more uh, uh, a larger road, eh? more lanes, but uh, the traffic jams are uh, are there again. So uh, that's uh, maybe important to, to get in mind. And let me end uh, by the Jevons paradox. Um, it sounds uh, sounds rocket science, but it, it isn't. In fact, it's a, it's an economist who um, who discovered. That um, if um, if you reduce uh, the uh, uh, the the cost, uh, if you if you increase the efficiency of uh, of of a um, of a kind of of, of energy, um, then uh, you get may although uh, the the consumption per unity is decreasing. Because it's 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 getting cheaper and easier to use, you get in general uh, an increase of use of of that uh, of that material. This is here uh, uh, to a hybrid a hybrid car, for instance. Uh, what you see is um, the uh, the use of a of a hybrid. And what what will you see is that uh, people are 
get are, are using their the hybrid car more, even if it's getting less ex, uh, expensive. So the um, the use uh, in general uh, of um, of transport modes um, risk to uh, to increase. Uh, so that's maybe important for uh, the discussion later on. Okay, thank you, Christoph. That, that was very interesting, especially these last uh, couple of uh, slides. And I would now give the word to Malen. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but I need Christoph to take down his screen sharing so I can share instead. Oh, right. Sure. Uh, so, can you see my uh, screen? Yeah. Yes. Yes, uh, I will try to be a little bit fast so that we also have time for discussions. I just want to start out with saying that I am a person who is, uh, I'm an urban planner and I've been working with transportation for the last 20 years, but I, I do it from not the overview, like a uh, bird's view perspective, but more from the city level, trying to understand why do people choose the mode of transport they do. But of course, I also need to look into how that uh, is connected to policy and planning. So just so we agree that this is this is where I'm starting from when I'm talking about this. Um, in Denmark, we actually have, you could say, an okay, uh, well-distributed train system. There is more in the capital region or in Copenhagen, uh, which is basically on the side where the Danish State Railway logo, the ESB logo is as well. Um, a little bit less close uh, in Jutland. Um, what we have here is basically the yellow lines is the fast, the speed trains. The red is between big cities, the green are the regional trains, and the um, darker red, which you can see in the Copenhagen region, are the S trains. So this is basically how the system is built up. Um, the speed is not terribly high, uh, and it's not terribly high because we also have a lot of um, challenges in Denmark with uh, old tracks that needs to be um, refurbished. Um, and that is mm, expensive, so it actually creates well, volume to challenges. Um, right now, there is a decline in train trips, and COVID-19 made it worse. Um, we have a new signal system that's being implemented. This has caused a lot of delays. The tracks need to be updated. There have been problems with new trains. Are Last uh, ICE trains were basically diesel trains because right when they were ordered was when the last uh, agreement on electricity or ele electrifying the train uh, lines um, fell apart. Then they ordered diesel trains. It took them 10 years to come. Then electricity was back up. And then uh, the Danish State Railways were suddenly standing there with some diesel trains that nobody actually really thought was a good idea. But now they just got a new set of trains that is also E-trains. There's been an increase in ticket price, uh, which has also affected the um, the use of the train, of course, I don't think economy is um, an argument in itself, but of course, economy also is also a way of, it's an argument that people use if they're already using their car, that there's no reason to take the train because it's just getting more and more expensive. And what also happened in Denmark during the COVID-19 was then people bought cars and they are using them instead of using the train. So there is there was a serious decline in train use during COVID-19 and the, the public transport transport system is still struggling with um, trying to meet that. Um, the electrification is actually, it's, there is a new plan. And when that plan is basically followed through, it means that 78% uh, of all trains are electrified. The green ones are the ones that are already done. The light greens are planned. The purple ones are planned, but not really yet politically decided. The pink ones is not decided yet, and um, all the orange ones were the ones that was already electrified in 2012. The gray ones are the only ones that are no plans to electrify right now. Uh, so that means there is actually um, a big um, plan to electrify the trains in, in Denmark. And if you look at the CO2 emission from transportation, the trains are also the ones that are doing absolutely the best uh, in this area. 
the last thing that when we talk about getting more people to travel by train, this is a really sad story. Uh, in 2013, they decided to make this one hour model, meaning it takes one hour to get from Copenhagen to Odense, one hour from Odense to Aarhus and one hour from Odense to Aalborg, for instance, between the four big cities. The whole idea with that was basically also to get rid of domestic flying because um, a three hour train trip is something that people have no problems to do. Today, it takes from Copenhagen to Aalborg, for instance, five and a half hour, and that makes a huge difference. Unfortunately, the government we have now canceled that or they didn't it exactly cancelled the plan, but they cancelled building the infrastructure that that plan actually need to be um, carried through. Uh, so I would see right now Denmark is actually in a little bit of um, not very good place. There is a lot of reasons why it works this way, but there is only one thing to say, and that is we are building more roads, uh, buying more cars and make it easier for people to be um, car drivers than uh, train drivers. Even if we do have focus on cycling, um, cycling is also declining in Denmark, um, especially in the bigger cities. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. This was also a little bit uh, sad to, to hear about the declining numbers of uh, rail use, but uh, we'll hopefully uh, discuss that later. Do we have any questions from the audience? Well, if if not, then I will maybe uh, break the ice. Uh, how uh, how do you see what what are the poss possibilities to stopping and uh, reversing uh, these trends? Because we, we have heard both in Denmark and in Croatia we have a falling uh, numbers. Uh, I'm sorry, we have a, a question from the audience, so I will uh, give it to. Um, yeah, it's uh, actually it's, it's a comment. Uh, I'm, I'm from Denmark. I live in the western part of Denmark, in the western Jutland, almost at the coast. And uh, place, uh, at least uh, with uh, not with lines, <laughs> maybe with uh, battery trains, uh, but uh, that's uh, for the future to show. And uh, our trains are run by, uh, in my part of the country, run by um, some uh, some some private private operators, um, they are not the same operator as, as, as uh, the, the DSB um, uh, trains. But we have to, uh, I think we have to just to clarify a bit about the systems that that the the internal system in, in, the, in the capital area is, uh, is running. Uh, I guess uh, the S train is, uh, is uh, having a surplus economically. Uh, now again, after after the Corona uh, virus, I think, but uh, there's a there's a deficit in the in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a, the local lines, and um, so we we have a difficulty uh, with that. And um, as Malena explained, uh, the main focus on the infrastructure plans from the government is to is to build more highways. Um, and uh, and the, but I, I don't I don't I, well, we just discussed it yesterday in a, in another forum and actually we don't think uh, from from Jutland we don't don't care about the one hour the one hour plan uh, the the thing is to have uh, have trains running all the way from actually having a direct line from from western from, from western or northern Jutland to uh, to directly to to Copenhagen and Copenhagen airport instead of instead of having to change uh, trains uh, a lot of times before we can uh, before we can get there so so it's not it's, it's not a, a, as crucial as, as it as it might have been make uh, made political with the one hour system but uh, we still have trains running Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Malena, would you like to uh, add something to this comment? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Uh, there is no doubt that's also what I try to say. There is a big difference between um, the more rural areas and the inner city of Copenhagen. One thing I actually forgot to say is that it's true that the S trains in Copenhagen 
uh, are doing really well. One of the reasons why is basically become you know, one of the reasons they guess, and I think I've seen it from the Danish Technical University, that's what they got out of their traffic habit um, investigations, is that this is to a high degree that it became for free and possible to bring your train on all uh, S-trains, your bike on the train. So you don't pay for it, you just bring your bike on the S-train, and that actually gave them a huge increase in the use of trains. So that's true. But in relation to the one-hour plan, I think the one-hour plan is really important in uh, relation to commuting. Um, I think we also need to close some highways. I'm not doubting that for a second or close down some connections. But I think if we want people commuting with train instead of commuting with um, with um with flights, domestic flights. And we actually have a huge rate of people using domestic flights. If you go to our neighboring country like Germany, they would have um, rules at a lot of the public workspaces where they would say you cannot fly if it's less than, I think they have a limit that says 800 kilometers. Uh, that's not how many kilometers there is from Copenhagen to Aalborg. So we are also used to, we have a very little, very low tolerance towards how long time commuting can take um, or just going to a meeting can take. So I think the one hour plan is very important when we look at business travel. If we want to get rid of domestic flight. And I think that's a good place to start. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Paul has raised his hand. Yeah, I think uh, basically both in, in all our countries and also on European level, I think we are lacking political ambitions uh, uh, put out in mobility plans saying really where do we want to go? Where do which kind of changes do we want to take in the transport sector and the balance between cars and aviation and uh, rail transport, I mean, can be stated where in countries where it has been done with the mobility plans, national and regional plans, uh, look, uh, look upon our neighbor country from Denmark in Sweden, it is possible uh, to to place, uh, to replace, I mean, to change uh, uh, the, the, the share, the mobility share among uh, transport modes. So it is of course possible, and it is also possible on European level. And we are still waiting for the European Commission uh, to uh, to produce uh, a strategy on on this, because uh, they are overall in the in the green recovery plan talking about the importance of uh, the railway sector also for international uh, journeys. So I think we have to look upon the political level to say if they they have to make up their mind what they are they want to do and bring up the relation between um, uh, uh, transport modes and uh, uh, green electrification and uh, 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 to say that that uh, railway the railway sector can do the job. I mean that that is quite basic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next uh, is Mr. Thomas. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. We can hear uh, yeah, I just, I just have a little rant, sorry. Uh, but when I see the statistics of which transport system that are most the worst for the environment or what is worth for my mind, it's always changed. This is the third debate I have just in this organization, and it always changed. So I'm getting a little annoyed using these statistics. Um, that said, um, I'm very glad for Christoph's uh, input yeah, because in Denmark we are trying to build bigger, bigger roads um, and make it easier for traffic. And we are destroying a lot of uh, woodland and natural treasures uh, as well uh, to build the, these big roads. And uh, I would very much like to see a big, bigger railway system. The problem in Denmark is we have to into the price increase. Right now, for those who are left to Copenhagen, it is, that's uh, the middle of Jutland to Copenhagen, it costs around 450 Danish crowns, and I can take a bus for 170, the same di di distance. So it's way more expensive than using other parts of the uh, public transport as well. Um, and also, it's just unreliable, really unreliable. Then if, uh, the train is delayed maybe an hour, and then it's just stopped coming. 
And it's very frustrating, especially because I've been to Japan, where it's, you don't have to wait. It just works. They are so quick to to adapt, and they have a very, very good uh, railway system to get you all across if Japan. So for how we can make it work in Europe, maybe we can take uh, some ex inspiration for what you do in Japan, because they can move a lot of people, really a lot of people there. So yeah, that's, that's my input. Uh, thank you. Uh, do we have anyone uh, else raising their hands? Uh, okay, uh, if not, I would like to maybe uh, ask a question that is more related to the EU level uh, uh, about the EU's Fit for 55 plan. Uh, I would like our experts to maybe have their give their opinions about the plan. What are ma the main positives? What are the negatives? What can maybe be improved? And can we uh, use uh, uh, a one size fits all approach like this, or maybe should we customize it more for national levels? So, is it even uh, achievable? Is it realistic? And uh, and uh, can we maybe uh, what can we do to ensure that we do uh, implement? I will start with uh, Bernard uh, for this one. And then we'll uh, rotate. Yes, I think it's achievable. Uh, I think, I mean, the uh, approach of uh, determining a goal, it's, uh, it's a good one, but uh, yeah, it should be left to the uh, countries itself to, to, to determine the way how to do it and I, I would relate to the management of railway services uh, which is uh, one of the reasons for the current situation so uh, so there are like we, we have been following EU regulations and of um, dividing the, the, the services. So we have uh, control, we have uh, infrastructure, and we have, uh, and we have uh, passenger transport as a three separated uh, uh, companies. We had uh, one holding that was kind of uh, coordinating and managing everything, but it was, it was uh, just eliminated, this holding. 10 years ago. So that's one of the reasons why we have like really not coordinated situation between different railway companies. We have uh, like a loco locomotive from a cargo company just like going, uh, make, making like empty travels all across the, the, the country instead of uh, taking the, the passenger because it is a different company has to be like divided. So basically, um, yeah, like within um, Institute for Political Ecology in Croatia, uh, like five, six years ago, a couple of us made a comparative analysis of like 11 or 12 different countries in Europe. Uh, unfortunately, Belgium and uh, Denmark were not one of them, uh, two of them. Uh, but yeah, we we uh, concluded that uh, in countries where the railway system is mostly deregulated, the quality of the services is uh, poorer, and where um, uh, the city of uh, the city, where the country has uh, more direct influence in the management, but also with uh, like really transparent supervision, that, that uh, the services are, are better. So yeah, I think that uh, like what should be done to improve the situation, I think that uh, on the national level, the, the goals should be, like the EU goals should be uh, implemented that uh, management and supervision of the railway companies should be like really uh, more horizontal and open to different kind of uh, stakeholders. And uh, also to um, really um, gave up of some tendencies for a further uh, privatization of the railway services. 
Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I especially found interesting the comment about the importance of regulation and the uh, management supervision and so on. Maybe uh, we can hear from a Christoph. Uh, what would be your perspective on this? Um, I would make it, um, maybe like to develop a bit further on that. Um, in fact, uh, the railway system is a very uh, integrated system. The link between infrastructure and 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 the uh, and the 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 running of trains is is, is very narrow. It's not like a, like in the the aviation. I mean, uh, once a uh, once a uh, a plane is in the air, uh, it has no longer uh, any any link uh, with the with the airports. Of course, it has a link with the airport at destination, hopefully, uh, but but not a physical link. I, I will say, um, and. Um, Contrary to the to the railway system, so I, I sometimes have the impression that um, um, on the European uh, level and the decisions that have been made uh, during the, the last uh, the last years uh, or last decades, um, one tries to to copy what what has happened in the in the uh, in the aviation, but I'm not sure that uh, that that railways function uh, on the, on the on the on the same uh, that you can apply the same the same rules in uh, in uh, in railway systems uh, due to 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 the essence of 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 railway systems uh, themselves and uh, the second thought on that is um, is that uh, investments in um, in uh, in railways uh, especially in infrastructure but also in rolling stock. Um, these are investments for uh, decades, uh, literally decades. So it's not easy for uh, private companies to take that decision, uh, what will happen uh, within 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a bit, to be honest, I'm a bit uh, skeptical towards uh, any, um any increase of of, of in fact uh, deregulation measures and, and privatization and uh, i'm afraid um it does uh, it does hinder more uh, the development than that it uh, um than that it uh, promotes it so that's my point okay thank you uh, and uh, malena would you like to add something yeah, I have to say I actually agree quite a lot with that. And just to come up with a Danish example, we have basically the S trains, the DSB trains, like the big trains, the tracks, the, all that is basically in different companies. Now it happened up through the 80s and 90s that everything got into these public-public partnerships with their own board, but they have to make a surplus and working together is always a competition situation. But one of the things they also did in Denmark was try to um privatize some of the the tracks or the like the going from one station to special stretches and the problem with that has been that e Denmark is such so small we are so dependent on Germany and Sweden uh, the most but Denmark is also such a small country that when you take that thing out from a system that is so connected and that thing has to work on its own if anything goes wrong in this system the big system can't put stuff in so basically one of the most yelled at uh, connections in, in Denmark is basically having these huge problems because it got privatized. Because whenever there's a train driver that is sick or somebody else is sick, they can't just some, take somebody from the big system and put it into that system. So that train runs on time and then they can dribble it down so they keep the trains on time. So it, it has a lot of... Uh, big problems because it, these trains are so dependent on each other. Um, I also think that the collaboration between, I mean, I can see how difficult it is in Denmark. It's also because we are not that many people. It's not a big country and we have our train system on so many different uh, companies. I'm doing that again. Um, and if we then have to collaborate with other countries and that also gives a multitude of companies, then it's it's never going to be an efficient system. So it's, it's I actually don't see it as a very good idea. And I think the question is also, do we want to start with getting private investors into investing in trains or do we actually want to start fighting for redoing the socioeconomic models we use to calculate what makes sense economically? Because the models we have now can only make cars that it's only cars that make sense and a big part of that is because there's none of the unintended i 
some of them. Very few of the unintended consequences, like uh, health and uh, uh, air pollution and noise and all that stuff, that's not part of the models we use. We only take out that people use so, so and so much time uh, in working so they can pay taxes because they are 15 minutes too late because there's a queue on the highway. So we don't have at, at the, a model now that can make that make trains come out with a positive result. And I think this is actually one of the first places that we need to start is fighting these socioeconomic models and who made the decision about what should actually be in these models. What is it that we take in? What is it that we calculate when we are making these huge decisions on infrastructure structure planning. So I think rather, um, yeah, but it's easier said than done. And I don't think it's all fine with ideas from the EU, but, and we all think we should have more sustainable mobility and we should do something about car driving. And then we build roads and don't pay for the infrastructure to build trains. So it is a little bit, depending on which mood I am in, in, in which state, but it is a little bit of a desperate situation where it's basically in many places, not moving in the right direction. There is an increase in car transport. That's because we are facilitating it. We are building its infrastructure. We're making it cheaper to buy cars. We're telling people do this for the future because then we are going to be wealthy and have a good and strong economy. That's basically the overall storytelling we do about this thing still, even if we know how unsustainable it is. Sorry for that. <laughs> Thank you. I have. Uh... Well, uh, we have heard already that uh, we have a, a trend of a declining use of trains in some countries, although not in Belgium. Uh, so Belgium, Belgium can be maybe a good example. Uh, so, uh, Christophe, maybe if you could share some of the good practices uh, uh, from Belgium, maybe that could be used in other EU member states to reverse these negative trends. I'm not sure uh, commuters will uh, <laughs> will, uh, will agree with your... Uh, <laughs> With your appreciation of the uh, of the, the train offer uh, in uh, in Belgium, but um, uh, I think the the main um, the main uh, reason uh, uh, of the or the main ex ex explanation for uh, for the, the the growth of, of travelers at least up, uh, until uh, the, the the COVID, uh, of course that that has has changed a bit. Um, uh, things, but um, I think the main um, the main explanation was uh, a, a tariff policy, which made uh, which made the train rather cheap. Uh, maybe not for um, uh, maybe not uh, for the the, the, the occasional uh, traveler, but especially for commuters who use the train uh, daily uh, and. Uh, and in, in weekends, uh, cheap tickets to the coastline, uh, for instance. Um, that explains shortly uh, also for, for younger people, for instance. Um, so uh, I think that that explains uh, that explains quite a lot. And on the on the other hand, uh, it's always uh, as as, uh, as uh, Malin also uh, said, it's always a kind of, of competition between modes of transport and um, Nowadays, our, our highway system is um, 50, 60 years old. So it needs uh, a, a structural uh, keep up, uh, viaducts, uh, tunnels, bridges, um, which means that uh, not only on the, on the railway network, but also and maybe even more on our highway uh, system, on our, our highways, um, we are confronted more and more with um, with uh, with lanes that are closed due to uh, reparation works or uh, or maintenance, uh, so that may, that may, uh, if if my if uh, if I take the train to uh, let's say to Antwerp, um, well, in most of the cases by train I know when I will arrive if there is not a delay, which sometimes happens. But let's say normally you know when you arrive when you take the car. Uh, when you take the car to Antwerp, to the city center of Antwerp, for instance, um, you're sure that you're not sure when uh, when you will uh, arrive. Uh, so, uh, so th that that gives also an impetus to the to the to the. It's 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 maybe it's 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 a bit uh, a stimulus by the by the negative, but uh, it it plays also uh, also a role. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, we have received uh, one more uh, question. Mr. Thomas has uh, 
would like to say something yeah please uh, go ahead yeah thank you it's an uh, add-on to uh, christopher um in estonia Tallinn, uh, the capital they have made it uh, free for the inhabitants to travel around in public transport that means they've saved a lot of uh, expansion of, uh, of um, roads and parking spaces and parking lots and they have used it as well as a cheap renting of uh, electric uh, i already call it uh, running wheels or something like that and so they're being very cheap for the inhabitants to travel the trains and that that means they're using a lot more of it so maybe with something we can maybe go up into different capitals and make different areas cheaper to travel the trains in thank you Okay, thank you. Uh, we have about two more minutes. I would like to give the opportunity to Bernard and Malena to give some quick uh, comments on uh, Christoph's uh, uh, answer. And uh, after that, uh, we will conclude the discussion and we will uh, kindly ask you to fulfill uh, a couple of uh, questions. We have a, a short survey about this discussion uh, that uh, uh, we, we would like you to uh, fulfill. So, uh, Bernard, please uh, go ahead, but uh, please be brief. Unmute. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, in short, I, I think that it is important to uh, include, uh, um, to include uh, uh, for, for entire transport system to be managed uh, centrally, and that includes a pricing system, that includes regulations, and that includes like deliberate uh, attempts of uh, shifting from, uh, from uh, road transport, especially from air transport. To the, to the rail. This can be done with the proper political will, um, considering that it is not being done in uh, most countries is showing that this will is uh, lacking. Um, yeah, different organizations um, like box organizations, including mine and, and others are trying to, to change that. And yeah, I hope that uh, railways will finally see uh, some new and better era, even in those countries where it is, the railways are declining. Thank you, Bernard and Malena. Yeah, I also would like to st uh, stop on an optimistic note. Uh, I absolutely also think it's possible. I think it's a little bit uphill, but I think it's possible. Actually, one of the interesting things is right now you cannot get uh, seating on a train through Copenhagen and Hamburg uh, until after September. So that's because people already started planning their summer holidays uh, and they planned that on trains, which is actually really, really positive news. From Hamburg, they go in different directions so they can move on from there. So there is something going on. I think that what we need is NGOs. I think we need um, different kind of actors. I'm I'm not that positive that it's going to come from the ministries or from um, national politics. I know in Denmark, the transport ministry is thinking climate change is only about electrification um, of cars. Uh, they don't believe in anything else. Uh, that's basically, they also believe in the hockey stick. Um, so I think that what we need is we need these NGOs, we need different kind of activists. We also need to support these kind of uh, different ways of making holidays because a lot of it is also redoing routines and practices of how we used to do things. And we had that car in center for a hundred years. So of course we can't redo that in five minutes. Thank you. Uh, I hope we can all learn something from each other. Uh, I would like to conclude this uh, debate. Thank you uh, for, to all three of our experts and thank you to everybody who has uh, joined and participated in this debate.